<laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, no, we're excited that um, you could uh, join us there, Aunty Jenny. We really yeah, appreciate taking you. the time. And you too, Michelle. So on that note, uh, it's one o'clock, so I think we'll just get straight into it. Uh, these mm -hmm. are being recorded, so at any time people can reference uh, these webinars on the FPDN website. Okay. So without any further ado, um, I'd just like to welcome everybody once again to the Taking Care of Disability Business webinars hosted by First People's Disability Network. And as always, I uh, just want to acknowledge that wherever we're zooming in from, that we are on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. So I want to pay my respects to um, our ancestors, our elders, uh, past, present and emerging, and any other Aboriginal people that are on this webinar. And also welcome to our non-Indigenous um, guests as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a pretty exciting um, lineup today. So the theme for today's session is going to be counselling. <clears throat> and it wasn't planned this way, but, excuse me, it wasn't planned this way, but um, this week is also International um, Men's Mental Health Week, mm, uh, which I thought was um, very fitting. Um, mm. As we know, like uh, for a lot of blokes, uh, we find it hard to, I guess, be vulnerable and talk about feelings and emotions, uh, especially, you know, I think um, just with friends and things like that. So more and more, we're trying to encourage um, our men to, I guess, speak up, um, own their feelings and learn how to sort of express them in uh, positive and safe ways. And so I think, you know, it's very fitting that today um, that we are going to be talking about counselling. Uh, we have our guest panellist, uh, Michelle Bates, who's um, based up in uh, Tennant Creek over there. And we also have Aunty Jenny Thompson. And so, um, yeah, Michelle's going to be talking on narrative therapy and, um, how it's different to other therapies, um, what's the difference between narrative practice and narrative therapy. And it's going to, I guess, spend some time describing the ways that it's a, a wonderful way to engage our Aboriginal people in counselling. And then we also have Aunty Jenny, who's an um, Aboriginal and African woman. Uh, her traditional links are the Waka Waka people um, and belonging to the Cubby Cubby language group of um, South Burnett area. We we're just saying before the webinar started that uh, my family's also from, from that area and the community of Shum. Um So yeah, without any further ado, I will hand over to Aunty Jenny. So thank you, Aunty Jenny. Okay. So what do you want to <laughs> You're talking about counselling. I just need to know what I'm to be talking about. So yeah, obviously just your experience um, in the counselling space, okay. have your own yeah. practice and I guess yeah. just different ways you've found um, useful to engage um, Aboriginal people or whoever mm -hmm. else that you've um, you've worked with. Yeah, okay. I've, I've, um, I guess over the 30 or 40 years I've worked intensely with, with our mob um, but also with non-Aboriginal people. Um, Going right across the board, I was just thinking with Michelle with narrative therapy. Um, I include that, but I call it in there uh, storytelling. And so I become uh, like a storyteller and as a listener, because um, a lot of times when people come, I think we talked, uh, you talked earlier about men, and uh, men don't, um, they just get together themselves or they don't go out. But I've had several men, and it's mostly about listening to their story. Um, I also I have, um, I guess it was handed down through my grandmother's side was the healing because it, uh, at least um, nine generations of my, on my grandmother's side that I can go back who were healers and as well as that midwives. So I've got a huge, um, not only from my, I guess my professional um, teachings and things like that, but I have a lot of things that were passed down through me, to me and through me. And so I work a lot in that area. Um, I work a lot like ancestral work. I do work um, just checking in. It's, I think I, earlier today I was just talking to someone and I was telling them about how important it is to get to know the person that you might be seeing and get to know them and their story. Uh, often they're not given that opportunity uh, and, and I don't, I don't usually use the word counselling. Um, I think more even healing, even saying I'm a healer and healing. It's more to open up. I always say it's about our approach to things and to people. 
and not to be specific around specific areas. So I've done a lot of work through adult men mental, mental health as well as children, uh, worked in schools and things like that. But I find my the storytelling, the narrative therapy, um, that is, is very useful in working with mob or even working with anybody really. Um, it is a really good, um, what sorts of word I can say tool, but um, it's, it is, it's about storytelling and then listening. And as I'm getting older, um, I, because I can tap into a lot of things and as I'm getting older, I've got to keep reminding myself that they say I tell a story and I can relate to that story but I, not to do that, like that's where the counselling comes in, not to do that, but to allow them to talk um, and their story. You might pick up a few little things. I think just with Tori, we just, we just spoke about was, um, you know, checking in on each other, uh, where, where do we come from and all that sort of thing. I've always found that very helpful and important in a lot of the work that I've done over the years. Um, I'm not sure if there's... I do things that I call uh, ancestral work. And the ancestral work is more sort of connecting to, again, our mob, but the ancestors. There's a lot of things within our dreaming stories and things like that, that we can relate. Um, often these stories will just pop up. These things will just pop up. And um, using the, the mediums, I guess, of sand play, of music, all sorts of things it is that um, the way it works. So, more, I work more these days as that storyteller, uh, story and listening, deep listening. And, and I use that deep listening, which is the Dadiri. And um, I think that came through from um, Daily River, um, Mary, Mary Mungabur Bowman. She, um, it was amazing how that sort of started for me. Um, I was in Darwin and um, I love art and, and books. So I went to this bookshop and um, and looking at art and the next minute this this book fell out at me and it and it was um, oh, something about good and evil and it was all about Miriam Rose and from that I looked at and I just saw that as a sign of how to how to work you know with deep listening and um, so I I run a I haven't done it for a while but I've run courses or things around deep listening. So I think the deep listening is, uh, it's deep within deep. And I know that through our Aboriginal way of listening, there's also, there's a three-way listening. There's the listening, first of all, it goes into our stomach and we feel it in Nalu. Then we bring it up. It comes from our head down to our stomach and then we, we mull over there, then it comes out. Before it comes out, it's like we've worked. So that's the three-way. It comes out and it, then it comes out in the way that it's supposed to come out. So, yeah. That's me. <laughs> so if there's anything, questions or anything, there's possibly, you know, being, I do a lot of work with children. I love working with children, but I don't work with children on their own. I work with, uh, with their parents uh, mostly or wherever that may come in. Um, yeah. So there's been lots and lots of different ways I've worked, emotion release, trauma, um, but using, usually I say it's, it's our approach, our approach to it as a counsellor. Okay. <clears throat> I see Michelle up there, yep. Yeah. So how was that, Tori? Was it, do you need any more? Um, yeah, no, that's, that's really great. I think, um, you know, like you've just articulated, um, you know, how I actually listened to people and wasn't even aware of that's the, the process of, of doing so. Mm. Um, so I, I think uh, for maybe if you could just expand a bit more on that listening technique, I'm pretty, pretty intrigued by that. Yeah. Um, there was a, yeah, well, the deep listening and I just, I, I went to um, a workshop or something some time ago and I think I'm just trying to remember um, Tex Cuthall. He he wrote a lot of things for the um, for mental health and working with children. Anyway, he 
talked about and they put a men's program together around that and they called it the NALU, NALU being your stomach. And a lot of things we, you know, our, our stomach is where we get a lot of our emotions and feelings is sort of, not so much the feelings, but it comes in there. And so, as I said, with the, with the deep listening, it's, um, it's deep within deep. And if you know of Mary Moreau's Ungerbear, she explains that very strongly with her, with the Dadiri, uh, when she gives that um, as a way to work. So, yeah, it's working, like I said, the three-way thinking, the three-way before we talk, it's like, okay, something might come in and it, it goes into our songs. We get the feeling in, in our stomach. Um, you learn to understand that. And, and I, I guess I can um, tap into people by using that method. It's, it's like that. Or we might say things like, um, you're feeling uncomfortable, what's going on for you? And then it just opens up that dialogue. But in, in that deep listening, it's deep within deep. It's not only, I mean, you can go back to transgenerational stuff. You can go back into trauma. Um, you can go, you can usually find this and it, but it's not just done in one session sort of thing. It's not done. You have to take it slow because there's a lot of things that's embedded in there. Um, I mean, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, you know, we have that, that um, uh, history of, um, well, I always say history or history, but there's a thing, you know, we go back 200 and something years and there's a lot of those things have been, but what we don't have is that we're what we, in a, it feels like we've lost it, is the, um, you know, back before then and our practices um, thing. So it's always good um, talking. I, I'll just give you a little example this morning. Um, my daughter's got a little group of, of kids that come in from the Northern Territory and everything she set up at school. And they're all sitting around making um, their boomerangs and they're doing things. These are young, young boys, young men. And, um, and they said to me, oh, woman, will you tell us some stories? See, a lot of those things that have stopped, um, you know, listening to our elders and, and that sort of thing. So we started talking. I started talking and taking them back about my grandfather how he was on a fighter, just talking about things like that. And it, I just, I think if you know your own, your own story, you, you know that, and then you can usually tap in like sometimes you might not get anything and then you ask the question of the person. Um, I really don't understand what you're talking about. I don't come in as the expert because it's a person that, that is sitting, they're the ones that have experienced this thing. And then we get to a point well, how do we start to clear it? How do we, how do we get it up from here and, and gradually bring it up that it sits, sits around your heart? Or, and that's where the emotions, there's all sorts of things around there before we speak out. So I always say that the listening, we hear here, our mung as we get, comes in here, comes down and goes down into our stomach and then we churn over that. It's just a whole lot of things and then it'll sort of gradually as we're working, as I'm working, you know, I'll be working with someone and I'm actually doing, doing things like pull, pulling it through. It's very much like if we talk about our nunkeries, we talk about our healers and people like that, the way that they would have worked. And so those things have been given. So it's just being able to, um, first of all, touch into that, that feeling in here. Um, you might even feel in yourself, you might feel something hot or, or um, your heart starts racing, this whole thing. So as a counsellor, as a therapist, you sort of sit with that, but you may not understand it fully. So you have to ask, well, how are you feeling at this point? And so it comes up, and like I said, it could take two or three uh, times, but sometimes what I say to people is, you can either do it the, the easy way or the hard way. And usually they say, well, what's the easy way? And I said, well, they're both the same because people, you know, you, yeah, it's, it's hard to sort of really explain, but using a lot of modalities that I have experienced in um, for the individual, the person that's sitting in front of you, they are the most important people. And I mean, working with children, 
uh, when I work with children, I usually, you know, um, I might call somebody in that that may be doing um, kinesiology or something like that. They sort of tap, text in. And I do a lot of work with children who are in care and, uh, and young people that have been in care over and over again. So it's working slowly and sort of taking them back so they, they start to make their reconnections. But it is that listening, um, deep listening, the dairy, deep listening. So, um, yes. Uh, I think the ancestral work, um, I'm not sure whether people are familiar with family constellation. Um, and so I connect that. I've been doing ancestral work for quite some time and tapping in, especially there you find out where people come from. Uh, we always check in, you know, who's your mob as we do. I don't, you don't come in as say, well, I'm um, Dr. So-and-so and I've got these degrees in blah, blah, blah. I never do that sort of thing. I'll check in and there's a story in there and the deep listening because that's how we start to connect. And then people, you can feel people coming more at ease with the thing. And so giving a time, you just don't do it um, not half an hour, an hour or something like that. You know, I've worked um, with people and it's been up to three hours because I don't like to, people to go straight away that you're going to leave them in the middle of something. So we work, so if there's, there's a few things that come up, um, I might take note of those sort of things and then I'll work through it with the, with the client, with the person and what, what do we want to do today. And so there's often, um, like I said, with, our, with young people in particular that have gone through the, um, you know, we talk stolen generation or they've gone through like that, people who've been through all that. And these are the things that we have today more. And it's, and it's also um, the ancestor work is tapping back into their story. Again, tapping back, what did your ancestors do? And it may, you know, a lot of our children are young people, even us, like I've got African, African-American in me. Um, and um, so, and in my, on my grandfather who married my grandmother, she's a Camilleroy woman. So there's a lot of those, you know, Waka and all those things are tapping into all that sort of thing. Um, so that's around, yeah, that's a bit around family constellation, but you pick, pick up more things around emotions. You might work, you might go back in. Um, I feel into things. I, I, I don't know, it was handed to me, it was given to me through my hand, and I feel. It's, it's like, okay, you can say nunkery, I don't use those words, we don't use those words, it's more, do we say healer? What I, I sort of present myself as old woman, because it's that sort of thing with an old woman, you, we, and I remember my old women, you know, that we could sit down and listen to their stories and things like that. So, um, the children that I work with, with this morning, I didn't actually work with them. I just sat with them, but they call me Gami. I told them, you know, my name now Gami now. I've been ceremony Gami Nunjana, meaning great grandmother, carrying mother spirit. But I said to them, you know, I grew up being called mum, mother, mother, mother. I said, so this is our stages of life. So when I when I talk about that, they talk about more about their grand. You know, it's there's a whole lot of things. Um. Yeah, it's, um, I'm just recollecting, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to uh, actually take off people. The way um, it's like, because I know I work, you know, I close my eyes and I look at colours, I do all sorts of things, I see things. I'm a seer and, and, and in all that as a seer, but I'm also an empath. So it's, sometimes that can be a bit of a problem for yourself because you know you can I've got I've had to learn not to go in too fast because um, am I am I listening to their story am I working with their story or am I working with my own so there's always in that healing process that as a counselor or a therapist or anything it's heal or heal thyself it's you've got to do your work and then that's where then the listening when you can sit back and I've got a, a an 86 year old friend of mine who has been counselling and therapist for a long time and she talks about the listening. Um, she's actually got a plaque up on her now she's become the listener. And what she does, 
she sits back in her chair, rocking chair, and she sits, somebody will come in, they lie down and talk, and they just talk. And while they're doing that, she's listening. But as she's listening, she's knitting. And she's crocheting or doing something like that. And um, so for me, I can't wait to get to that point because, um, yeah, that's as you get older, um, wisdom comes from experience. Um, yeah, it's family constellation work takes you, takes you a lot. It takes you across the board. I think I talk, I said earlier, some of my teachings or some of the, the not so much teachings, the workshops that I've done in hospitals and things as nurses and teachers and people like that. I always get them, I'll say, how many cultures are within this room? And they don't know. Some of the people say, oh, we don't know. And then I'll start. Well, I've got Aboriginal and on my Aboriginal both sides, Camilla Roy or Waka Waka. Then my father is African-American. We say African there, there. And we've got Chinese and we've got um, Chinese and Irish. So that sort of brings, so once I open that up, people start to open up. And when you get to know, for instance, where somebody comes from, um, you know, from another side of the world, you sort of get to know the, the stories and things that may have gone on in there. And I'm talking about the hurt stories. I'm talking about all that stuff. And how do we then get back to the good stuff that, you know, they feel, they feel. So there's, that's around transgenerational stuff. And, um, yeah, so I use quite a few different modalities and things. I've got more people coming to me now for healing. Um, and I just say heal or heal thyself because we've all, all of us have got healing. We're, we've got it within us. And whatever we do, whatever we need to do, be it sit by the river, uh, play in clay, work in dirt, Maybe, you know, set a fire, sit there, let things. Um, and I, I just believe that, that that is some ways in in our generations before us. Um, these are the things that they would have done sat quietly. You know, I can reflect and see my grandfather who was taken away, taken out of his country when he was 13 and a half. He was the eldest and uh, of the family. He was an honour fighter. This is what I was telling the boys today. And um, he used to just sit and under a tree and making boomerangs and things like that. So I was able to talk, tell that story to these young fellows and sort of make them feel proud of who they are and also of their, their cultural links. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for sharing um, your experiences uh, with us, Art. And I think, too, it's great to see, like, you know, you, you yourself have um, highly qualified I guess with the university degrees, but yeah. also um, integrating um, traditional and spiritual healing as well, which I think, um, uh, you know, very important for more, but I think also too that um, others will also uh, be able to, to get a lot of um, healing out of that themselves through mm. the different modalities that you speak of. Mm. Uh, so if there's any questions for Arnie Jenny, please um, use the uh, Q&A um, function down at the bottom of your screen there. <clears throat> so um, we might leave that open for a couple of minutes just as people want to um, ask questions. And uh, we've also got Ray Peckham who's um, who's joined us. Hey, brother Ray, hope you're well. Hey, guys. How are Hello, you? Ray. Hello. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Art. How are you? Good, thanks. Yeah. Sorry I linked in a bit late. So I, I, I forgot that I had a hotspot on my phone. So I, so I linked in with my um, computer now, so which is good. So, yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Ray's um, another guest panellist, and Ray will be talking on, um, I guess, the need for counselling services within the justice system and, um, I guess, what can be improved upon in that area. I don't see any um, questions coming through, but if um, only Jenny, if it's all right, if you're going to hang around, maybe people can yep. um, post and you can respond to them later on. Yep. Cool. Thank you. So um, on that note, I will now hand over to Michelle Bates, who is going to be talking about uh, narrative therapy. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Tori. And thanks, Aunty Jenny. Uh, I could sit and listen to you all day, I think. <laughs> uh, 
um, such um, wonderful skills like you have. Thank you. Um, I am really excited to be here. Um, whenever I speak with a group, I always want to first acknowledge um, the, the country I'm living on currently, which is Waramangu Manu. Manu is a Waramangu word for country. Um, and it's around the area of Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory. And I've lived here for five and a half years. Um, and I'm, I'm always a bit careful about what I speak about and to whom I speak. Um, the, the forces of the country here are really um, powerful and um, I always like to, to check in, particularly as there's a strong connection, of course, in many places, but a very strong connection here between um, people and, and their manu. And so there's a few people that I consult whenever I talk about something because it's always, um, I'm always drawing on um, the place and the people um, as examples, which I'll share with you. And so I feel a need to ask, ask permission, which I have. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, my ancestry, um, which is a mixed bag, or I heard someone the other day describe it as a mixed grill <laughs> of um, First Peoples uh, descendancy, the Anawan people from the ranges and um, tablelands area of what we would know now as northern, northwestern New South Wales. Um, and I have a Irish English um, mm -hmm. line as well. So um, in 20 minutes or so, I'm going to do my very best to try to um, at least give an un a bit of an unpacking of, um, to increase people's understanding of what narrative practice is, what narrative therapy is. Um, and um, apologies if I'm preaching to any people that are already converted to the beautiful craft of narrative practice. Um, so I'll jump in. It's 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 very exciting. <laughs> um, I think uh, narrative practice is particularly um, interesting to me because of its um, application in many different contexts and with many different people. Um, in this conversation, and for me, having worked with. Um, people living with a disability, children and adults and their families for more than 30 years, um, I've found narrative practice to be a very um, open way for many people to find a way to express themselves, explore um, problems that they might be facing. So in a, in a nutshell, um, Narrative um, therapy, narrative practice, and narrative um, ways of working, all of that jargon, I'll just spend a few minutes tackling some of that jargon. Um, it is um, very strong in Australia and across the world, and the Dulwich Centre in South Australia, uh, Adelaide, is the um, international centre for narrative practice and community work. And a man called Michael White, and an Australian and um, another man, Dave, David Epstein, who is a Kiwi, I think. Um, they worked very um, strongly together, starting out in um, family therapy and developed narrative ways of working as a way of assisting people to um, understand themselves um, and their relationship to the world um, better. So... Um, I prefer to talk about narrative practice. Um, I refer to myself as a narrative practitioner. Um, often I think because I'm not, I'm not um, dismissing therapy at all, um, but it can sometimes um, confuse people or sometimes, in my experience, frighten people. I think um, therapy as a word um, has had... Um, 
has many different um, connotations associated with it. Um, similarly, with practice, people will often say, well, what do you mean by practice? And um, it's, it's the way of working. It's the way of being with um, another person in, in working with them to uh, feel better, understand um, the problem better. So narrative um, practice, narrative ways of working, um, basically um, we seek to offer a respectful, non-blaming approach to um, counselling space and also community work. Um, one of the distinctive aspects of narrative practice is that it, it centres the person who is seeking the talking space as the expert in their own lives. And we work to separate the, a perceived problem from the identity of the person. So um, when we hold problems separate from people, we then get to explore the many skills and beliefs and values and abilities that people have that will assist them to reduce the influence of the problem on their lives. So an example of that might be um, uh, someone who might have an addiction, an addi a, a, a problem with um, a, a substance. And so a, a person might say, um, I'm a drug addict. And they identify as that. And maybe even community and media and, and other people um, also identify that person as that. But that is that is one thing about that person. That is what we call a, a single story of the person's life. If we can assist the person to um, take that that uh, problem, the, the problem is the drug, not the person. Um, and we can assist people to develop a different connection, a different relationship with that problem story. Um, and also then um, we would work with that person as the expert in their own life, in their own lived experience, um, to try to find ways they might relate differently and hopefully overcome um, the problem. I'm, ho I'm hoping this is making sense. I'm kind of talking to my own face. Um, <laughs> Corey, you'll let me know if there are any questions popping up or points of clarity. That would be um, really helpful. It, or if anybody would want to add or, or share an experience. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's all making sense, Michelle. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, Rose, and Goda's just asked if you could speak a bit louder, please, Michelle. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I should have said that as a disclaimer at the start. I'm hoping that's better. I will um, speak more loudly. Thank you, Rose. Um, so there are different principles which inform narrative ways of working. Um, and two of the more significant ones for me are that um, a, a good or capable narrative practitioner will always maintain a stance or position of curiosity. To be curious about um, a person's life removes judgment. Um, and in many, many times over, I've, I've witnessed um, that curiosity can really help people to feel warm and comfortable in, in the space when they're talking about really um, serious uh, concerns. And the other is in being curious to ask questions to which I absolutely don't know the answer to. So what that does is it, it de-centres me as a perceived um, authority or expert. You know, people come to a talking space, sitting down um, and they're talking about their lives what works really very well and is and is a kind of cornerstone of narrative approaches is that um, I can shed all of my preconceived ideas. I can hold my knowledge, let's say, of um, 
the impact of drug addiction and what that might mean and what that might mean for that person and their other roles in their life and their family. But my, my job um, as a narrative practitioner is to assist people by asking questions that I don't know the answer to, to try to keep digging, digging in deeper and deeper um, into their lives and across their whole life story. Um, their memories, where their, where their values came from, who else in their life um, understands that they have strength of character and wonderful experience and rich skills at the same time as having um, the problem story of drug addiction. So um, some other aspects of narrative ways of working or narrative practice that I wanted to share with you today in our short time um, is to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the language we use but I'll try not to use too much uh, uh, more jargon but um, narrative practitioners are interested in working with people to to bring forth and thicken stories and the, they're the stories that that um, we can expand on that don't um, contribute to holding that problem in place. So as people begin to um, talk about alternative stories, so talk about themselves um, not as a drug addict or a person addicted to drugs, but all the other stories that make up that person, um, we get to move beyond... Um, solving problems because with the new stories people get to hear themselves speaking about themselves with new possibilities um, for relationships new possibilities for for their future rather than from the, uh, the point of being stuck where they are with the problem story that they're trying to work on um, um, and so with the view from the narrative practice perspective that our lives are multi-storied, um, so those stories are occurring sometimes at the same time. Um, so say different stories at the same time um, and maybe even in a, a talking space that we offer, there could be different um, remembering or different imaginings of a story that a person has told many times but with curiosity and and um, open questioning and not imposing um, expertise into the space but acknowledging the person's expertise all kinds of things can be discovered about um, the person's um, remembering of events that might contribute to where they find themselves now um, I want to mention that um, if anyone is interested uh, there is a, a woman uh, whose name is um, Chimamanda uh, Adichie and she um, I think has done a couple of TED talks and also is an author and she, uh, you'll find if you um, look for her name, she spoke about the danger of a single story and it really is a wonderful um, 20 minutes or so that um, you could spend uh, because she really... Um, with warmth and humour, uh, sheds really interesting light on the danger of being um, regarded by just um, one story of our lives. And, you know, in when I think about my work with um, families and individuals living with a disability over many years, um, it's so very hard to see... Um, people having to live the experience of being defined by disability because the person's entire personhood um, can sometimes um, be overshadowed, which um, is not the way we, we want people to live in our world. Um, what else can I say? <coughs> No, oh, that's great, Michelle. Um, I, I like the idea that, um, you know, of approaching a person as not just one facet of their life, but 
I'm taking the time to sit, listen and understand um, all the other components and stories that actually makes a person who they are. It's not just that one issue that they might be dealing with. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips around, like, because um, I know from time to time, like, um, my mates and stuff, they'll come to me and have a yarn and um, mm. I'd like to learn a bit more about this narrative therapy stuff. Um, but one thing I've found is in talking to, like, mates and that is sometimes they can just get sort of stuck in, like, what what a problem is that they're currently facing and and then there's all this, I guess, negative self-talk and Mm. all the rest are around like how that's defining them um do you have any kind of tips around how to mm. i mean you know like when like you said we're not the experts but i mean sitting across this person that i know well i know that um you know there's a lot more positives in their lives so i guess my question is any way you can kind of steer the conversation and get people to maybe just start considering these other aspects of their life, which are, which I guess outweigh the negative that they're focused on. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it does. Great, yeah. great, great question. Um, I think I would encourage you to, to practice some questioning. So to, I'm imagining um, you're right, that, that when, uh -huh. when a, a problem is bearing down. I'm still online it's really um, difficult to think or talk about anything else. But the, the um, wonderful um, way that I've seen questions um, try to help move people around the problem story. So to give an example, um, and I guess this also applies in um, contexts in some of my work where I work with people who aren't able to use their voice to communicate. Um, their people might um, uh, find it tricky to sit still for very long um, or to f even focus on themselves. But, but practising and exploring with questions is a way to try and invite people um, to keep talking or keep expressing um, yet still not just focus on the absolute weight of the problem but but explore it and if you're exploring something curiously with someone you can really go such a long way um, mm. and I, I can I can remember sometimes also I'm not sure if this is for you Tori and others but feeling the the pain of someone's problem and you you get you get stuck in it you're you're with them in in them in that journey and sometimes that empath empathy approach is really essential but if we can try and acknowledge that we are we are listener and we are not it it, it isn't our um, story to hold mm. but it's our role to guide um, and try to assist maybe your mate might um, get a bit of a surprise if you ask a question something like um, yeah look I've, I've heard you talk about this story before and it's it's it really is a problem I really get it and I wonder like when might there have been other times in your life where you've had to be just so burdened by a big story can you tell me can you tell me about that and then it it's, you're still talking about the problem but you're just slightly shifting to try and assist people to be thinking in another way about the burden of that problem story um, do they know yeah. anybody else do they know anyone else who's also experienced this and what did they do to get through what what helped them when they were feeling down or feeling worried yeah, I really like how you um, ask that question as well because it frames it in a way that um, it's like, well, you've had problems in the past, as everybody does, but it's kind of like what mm. helped you get through that time, what kept you strong during that experience, and can you kind of relate some of that to what you're going through now? So, yeah, um, that's really great, Michelle. We just had a request from um, someone in the comments just asking um, the name of that lady that gave the TED talk and if you could um, just post that in the chat that would be great. Yeah I will for sure. 
Um, yeah, so thanks, Michelle, for, for sharing that. Um, that's really, um, really oh, interesting oh, stuff. Corey, can I just Powerful. ask Michelle one quick question? Michelle, um, have you worked with former inmates around that um, sort of narrative um, area? You know, like a lot of inmates go incarcerated from, from drug or alcohol issues and, and things like that. Um, they, they sort of, when they're actually incarcerated, they don't get the support that they do when they're in. There's something I'm gonna talk about a little bit when it's my turn. But when they get out, there's actually just, um, there's no support, other support out there that, that actually, um, that they wanna express their feelings, you know, of what they've done and why they was in there, you know? Um, yeah. Have you come across any sort of similarity or sim similar incidents, you know, yeah. uh, on your path? And 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 you you you've already said, um, you know, you clarified some of the stuff that you've just said, and you put it in context for me, you know. And I can relate to some of those um, from being myself being incarcerated, you know. So the thing about narrative ways of working is they have so much application. So, for example, with children that are um, you know, label the naughty kids at school. You can have yeah. so much fun exploring their skills and abilities. Mm. Um, in your um, example with working with um, people that have been incarcerated, um, I've done a small amount of work that I would really like to um, do more of. Mm. Um, we have a we have the Barclay Work Camp here, which is a kind of open um, prison facility. Yeah. where people come come and go to do work matters, uh, work, work around the community. Um, and it's designed to try to um, assist men to stay connected to community and contribute to community while they're doing their time. Yeah. Um, and there have been three um, individuals that I've spoken with. A um, little bit tricky when... Um, there's that kind of gender stuff to overcome for some people, but what we've um, what we've learned in those conversations is that uh, narrative practice offers people a um, a way to explore and continue to um, keep building on um, memories and learnings in order to set up. Um, a better future. There's some. I'm thinking about some of the words that people that men have talked about that they they have felt so nervous before talking to a counsellor, for example. Mm. Um, and even though I am a counsellor, um, I think it's, it goes back to the questions, the curious questions. I think mm. that people can you can easily assist people to feel safe when you want what what you want them to do is to talk about themselves and their story. Yeah rather than answer questions or respond or be accountable for the, mm. the talking space. No, I, I better stop talking because it's okay. your turn. Okay. Oh, you want me to start, Tori? Yeah, that'll be great. Thanks, Ray. Okay, no worries. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Ray Peckham and um, I'm a Riadri man from, from Wellington, New South Wales. Um, I've got... Um, Bit like all of us, you know, we've got a, all got a bit of mix of uh, Tosias in us. Um, you know, my, my great great grandparents, my, my great great grandmother is a uh, Scottish you know, mm. um, lady, she is, and my great great grandfather is a full blooded Mary uh, mm. girl, a uh, man from New Zealand. So mm. I've got a, um, a bit, bit of it uh, in me too. But I just wanted to um, just talk a little bit about my experience. In, in the last seven months, um, I've been incarcerated um, in the Bathurst and Wellington Correctional Centre um, since October last year. Now, um, I, went to the, I went to the Orange Court from, um, from, from Orange Base Hospital, straight out of hospital, straight to court. The judge said, um, bail refuse. Um, Mr. Peckham can get all the health service he wants when he's incarcerated. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Now, 
I went to I went to jail with um, twelve broken ribs, um, a punctured lung, bruised kidney, bruised liver, laceration to my right cheek, and also um, head injuries. Now, since my time in in Bathurst, um, I've i they actually instead of put me in the main, they actually put me in a in a in a wing where um, it's called the the detox. And that unit is where all if you're coming in from coming in from the from the community and you get incarcerated from from drug and alcohol issues and you haven't you know Down syndrome from it and all that you know so they put you in there to keep an eye on you for twenty four seven so that's where I was for the first two weeks um, and in that first two weeks in the second week I seen a doctor and um, they um, checked on my, my health um, and all that. Um, and because I've had, you know, I, I had diabetes and high blood pressure and, and all the other um, health issues that my grandmother left me, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I was dealing with that. But after, after the two weeks, you know, I, I started, um, started having nightmares of the incident when I was badly assaulted. Um, I was hearing stories. I, 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 was, I was having nightmares about, um, about when I was getting assaulted. I can see um, the other guy that had a knife to my throat and to my cheek and where he's laceration, you know. Um, and, um, and I couldn't sleep. In Bathurst, I was having three to four hours sleep. And I kept saying this every time I would go over to the to the clinic, I would say, I really, really need to see the doctor again. I really, really need, I said, because something is wrong. I am not right. Um, and they basically said, well, we need to put you on the list. Do you know how long it takes you to see a doctor in E-Ray? Up to three months to 12 months to see a doctor. And I said, well, I only seen a doctor three weeks ago, you know? Oh, yeah, but you're one inmate of six or 700 inmates in this jail, mm. you know? And I said, well, are they going through the same sort of um, health issues that I'm having? You know, I've been a beauty, uh, brutal assaulted and end up in prison while the other guy still walking the street. But I just like to say, um, you know, people are not arcs, you know, they are okay when they're in prison, you know. Unless I speak out, they wouldn't know if, if, I, were, if I had a problem or not. Um, when I had my first shower, when I got, went into the mainstream prison, I had my first shower from, my, from the left of my right ribs to the middle of my back was black as purple. It was from the bruises and the the the, damage, the assault that was taken on me. And a few of my few of the inmates there, white, Muslim, brothers, and they all know me as Uncle Ray. What happened to you? What happened to you? Oh my goodness. You know, and I said I'll tell you the story one day when we're outside, when I've, you know, when I've got time to tell you and, 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 and when I want to talk about it. And they just said, no worries, you know. And, um, but to, to get the, the appropriate support that you need in prison, they call what you call a referral form. It's like when you go to the doctor and the doctor writes a referral for you to go to the specialist or go and get x-rays done. MRI scans and things like that, you know, it was like that. But the difference is, it could get lost between the office and to the clinic. You know, and you could be waiting anywhere from a week to four weeks to three months, you know, just to see the nurse. And then when you tell the nurse about some of the, 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 the issues that you're having, even when you're having mental health issues, depression, 
anxiety, can't sleep, mm -hmm. you know, you ask them to see the doctor. And you know what the waiting time is to see a doctor? Over 12 months. Mm. Over 12 months. And for an inmate to see a doctor, you've got to be dying in your cell. You have to be dying in your cell to see a doctor. And I've seen that happen on two occasions in the Wellington Correctional Centre where, you know, there was a couple of guys in there that was really, really sick. And, and, in, and in prison, you got to act tough sometimes too. Mm. You know, and you don't want to go up to the clinic because other prisoners think that you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. So they just say, I'm sick in cell. And then when the officers come around to say, what's the matter with you guys? You say, well, I'm sick and I'm sick in cell. I need to, you know, to get a referral form to the nurse so I can see the nurse. And, and just to see the nurse can take ages too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very appalling of the, uh, of the, um, the, justice, the, the justice health system. Very appalling. And we wonder why so many of our mob die in custody, mm. you know? Um, and like there, there was one point where nurses, you know, when one of our mob was chucking a fit, he was having to fit in his cell. Yeah. And then I can see nurses coming, walking, absolutely walking, didn't really give two craps about you know, if you're coming through the fit or not, you know. And another part where they would, you know, if someone's really badly injured, you know, one of the, um, he was a non-Aboriginal guy and he actually had a fall in the shower and fell over and his head was actually in the toilet bowl. <sighs> and, and, and they got him out and he was upstairs. And actually, up on the level one he was, where his cell was. And, you know, the nurses, they had they'd just come down and, you know, I think they worked on him for at least 15 to 20 minutes before the ambulance actually come. No doctor on site. You know, and then they rushed him to Dubbo Base Hospital by um, air ambulance then. You know, and it, it's, it's just really, really appalling, you know. With my medication, you know, um, I had to get the, the nurses to actually ring the AMS up in Wellington to give them my medication um, of what I take for my diabetes. You know, for my, um, I went in with a bit of um, anxiety, but my anxiety went to roof when I was in there. So, um, and, you know, like it's, I wouldn't recommend anyone from going to prison. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, you know, because it's not a good place. Not a good place. I, th I believe there's a lot of racism mm -hmm. in prison. I think, I think they only look after who they want to look after. Um, but, you know, far as the, the health system goes, you know, it's, it's very appalling. Very appalling, it is. Um, and, um, and with the problems too, you know, like um, with some of the inmates and that, you know, and, and as um, Michelle said a, a bit early on, you know, a, a lot of my mates, a lot, not my, so much my mate, but I'm gonna call them um, people, but a lot of the guys that came into prison with drug and alcohol issues and all that sort of thing. And yeah, they are different. They are different when they got alcohol in them. They are different when they got drugs in them, you know? And one thing I can say about, I met these people and I tell you what, geez, I would do anything for those people because geez, I was, you know, I met some really, really great blokes. I met a lot of uncles in there. I thought I was the oldest bloke in prison. 
I thought it was, I was bloke, but a couple of new fellas come in from out in the far west area, and we got we all got in like a house on fire, you know, and supported one another. We always made sure that all the uncles had food, um, you know, and making sure that they, you know, had other other issues that that they was happening to them, make sure they was getting it, you know. Um, one thing that I was particularly uh, were doing, um, when someone is, um, tell the, the officers say that I'm sick, for example, um, if they don't go to work that day, well, they, got it, they get locked up in their cell and they call sick in cell. Then they fill out a referral form. And that officer, he could do anything with that, re um, with that referral form. It mightn't even reach the clinic, as I said early on. You know, my rice says they're supposed to fax it up to the clinic, and then it could take three or four weeks before the nurse can come down or send a message down to that pod to say, Can you send Ray Peckham up to the clinic, please? So we can find out what's, what's going on and what's the matter with him. You know, so he could, so I could be locked up in my cell for two or three weeks. Mm. Um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And it's just, it's just not the same as it is in the community. It's, it's, it's totally different. And I say this, and, 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 and I'm very honoured of, of, um, of Tori um, inviting me to come along here. When I, when I, I actually went to the Orange Court from, from hospital, and, and, um, and I like to say one thing to that judge, you know, he's a bullshit liar because you don't get the same support in jail mm -hmm. when you're out in the in your own community mm -hmm. you know so um and as i said early on i wouldn't recommend my own worst enemy to go to jail you know because it's not a very good place um i'm 55 years of age and first time ever incarcerated in my life i never you know i don't never smoked in my life i never took any drugs in my life um, you know, and I've seen a lot of it go around in, 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 in jail, but, you know, you do, you do your own thing, you make your own, um, your own friends up, you know, and you get looked after. Um, and to me, a lot of my brothers looked after me pretty well when I was there, and they made sure that I got, I got the, um, the proper help that I can get in there, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for um, sharing your experience there, Ray. I'm pretty sure it's not easy, um, you know, rehashing that, that story. Uh, we've got Noel Johnston, who's um, also said sorry for your experience, that it's disgraceful, mm -hmm. and it's uh, a legal system and, and not a justice system. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just thought, you know, for you to come on and, and talk about that, especially in line with, um, you know, what these webinars are, are sort of targeted towards the um, end up providers working with um, mob, um, you know, that have got disabilities. Um, I could just picture somebody um, going through that system that's got maybe an undiagnosed um, condition and sort of having to, to struggle through that. And mm. yeah, yeah, it's just... Um, every, time I, 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 every time that I went up to get my insulin over morning at seven o'clock in the morning, I always say to them, look, I really, really need to see the doctor. You know? And they just say, you know, they'll just repeat themselves by saying, no, you will never get to see the doctor in here. You'd be better off waiting until you get out to go to your own community doctor or family doctor. Mm. And, you know, and I even said to one of the nurses, the judge reckons I would get the best support, health support in here. And you know what she said to me, this nurse? She said, well, you tell that judge he's a bloody liar. And I said, no, well, you ring up and tell him. You know? so, and, 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 and she's true. She, she said there's not much that we can do. They couldn't even take me to go and get a, um, a head scan, MRI, um, a CAT scan on my head. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go and see if my ribs are healed properly. You know, mm -hmm. I know they got a heal properly, but you know, I, for the first six months, I could not do anything in jail. Could not do anything, you know. They're yeah, shocking. Guys, we're a bit after um, yep. two o'clock, but, um, you know, for those that want to hang around, I understand people may have to go to other meetings mm. and things, but 
for those that want to hang around and have a bit of a yarn, we've got a couple of questions. Um, one's come from Rose, and I think this is probably for Aunty Jenny and Michelle, and maybe yourself, Ray, you might want to be able to speak to this. Mm. Can't hear. Oh. What do we have to do? Um, keep the questions. Yeah. So um, Rose is just asking, um, how how do people become a better listener? Hmm. Um, yeah. I like to sort of. I think. For myself, it was being able to, as a child, um, uh, having my old people around me and, um, and when they would talk, um, I think while, you know, while I, um, you know, we can talk about narrative, we can talk about deep listening and things, but the deep listening, I guess for me, I learned to do that from a young age. It was like, because the old people would sit and listen, they would not um, intercede. They would, each of them would, and as as a child, I would sit and listen to them. And so they would say things. And um, as I got older and learning, because Ray, as um, you were talking, um, and I can feel this whole thing through my body. And um, listening, it's being able to, in a sense, listen to your own story and know that because often we get you know, we'll go to counsellors and people like that and actually um, they're actually sitting there. I worked in, in, in um, mental health places and everything and I've, I've witnessed even in, in some of the, I worked in women's prisons and I worked in um, youth detention centres and I've also been an, involved in, in sort of being in, in mental institutions. And some of those, you know, just in, in watching how someone was coming in with a story and no one that was there willing to listen to that story. Because again, you know, there's a story within stories within stories. So I guess what I saw at, in, in my life and what I saw from everywhere, I didn't, you just knew there were times to listen and there were times to talk. And so, as I, as I get older, and, you know, I'm 75, and to, I'm still listening, I listen to you, Ray. I listen to you with every being, every part of my being. I listen through my stomach, I listen through my head, stories that would keep coming backwards and forwards. I've also learned in that listening is not to interject and to, and to let the person tell their story. And I just want to thank you, Ray, because what you talked about there, you know, a lot has been my experience in working within detention centres with the children and, and in women's uh, walking, talking and, and even being with men after they came out and being able to talk. So I sort of can reflect back to how the old people would sit and, and listen. And one person, you know, you'd, they'd be talking. They'd be talking amongst themselves. And if I didn't listen in those times of growing up, there was, a, there was this way, you know, that people would say children are to be seen and not heard. That was an old thing. But I was able to, in learning through my old people, my aunties, who I used to, they would get um, me, you know, I, I'm reflecting back to my story in about having Munyu, I'll talk about, lice in my hair. 
how they used to call me in, come on, you come over here and sit. But I wasn't allowed to make a sound and I was listening. And as I got older, I fully understood um, things that they were talking about at that particular time I didn't know. But I know what they were doing and they were instilling these, these things within me. Um, have I gone out to learn more like a, like a narrative therapy or any of those things? I'll get a touch on those. But unless we can listen, and as, as, I, as I grew up and got older and now I am, if we can listen with our whole being and, and be conscious of, of certain things that might happen within your body, knowing, oh, where's this coming from? And then listening to that. And I said this, and I say this all the time, is we are not the experts as counsellors or whatever. It's a person that's sitting in front of us. And I know I've worked in, in, um, in hospitals. I've worked with psychologists. And I've actually been the Indigenous consultant in, in a, um, at the MARTA, Indigenous consultant. And not to come across, and a lot of my, I was saying to a lot of the, the therapists or the so-called specialists, you know, to listen and listen deeply within it. And a lot of people are afraid to go there because it could be bringing up something and just listening to you, Ray, and um, it was bringing up a lot of things. And I and I've, I've haven't experienced what you were talking about in, in as being a man in big, as we call big jail with the kids, but I know that then in those in those places, there were a lot of old fellas that were in there that were probably lifers and things. And I got these these things that come back because there was a um, there was always a group of people within the jails and things um, who would be there that you could rely on and be be supportive of our our mob going in with our young people. Um, all of those things you've just opened up in me and the women in particular, not so much the young because we had, we tried to, you know, a lot of things. But what's happened is, in over time, is that our, our jails, our institutions, it's just, they've just come full. It's overcrowded. It's yep. like people are putting our mob, our children. I was just reading something. Um, might have been yesterday or something, how, you know, they're talking about these places being being overcrowded or... And so you, you can see, you know, that there is nothing in those places that... Because they'll, they'll talk, we've got 120 or more people in there. So you, the individual, um, to get individual um, attention... Mm. I guess it's very difficult. Yeah. Well, it, it, absolutely, it is, Aunt. It, it's yeah. it's it's a shocking, you know. Like, yeah. Um, I've I've it had to take my solicitor who came and visit me. Um, the 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 story that I wanted to tell, it took a young lady from victim services, who said, "Yeah, I'll sit down and I'll listen to your story, Ray," mm. and and because of my assault that I had was with my ex-partner and her new partner that assaulted me. Mm. I basically withdraw myself from, from females, you know, Art. Yep. I said to myself, I'm not going to trust any females anymore. Mm. I've been hurt too much, you know, and this, this lady from victim services, you know, and I, I basically said to her, I'm, I'm actually, I'll tell you my story, but I'm not going to trust you, mm. you know, but I will tell you a story because I actually need support. And seven months later or nine months la later now, she still rings me two days a week mm. for counselling sessions. And I said to her when I actually got out and because of the coronavirus, I sort of, 
I was looking for her. I was waiting for her to come and get me. But then the coronavirus hit and then they stopped all visiting rights and all that, you know. Then when I got released, my family tracked her down and she was so excited to hear my voice. So excited and I was so happy to hear her voice. Mm -hmm. And then now she is, um, got me in the right place where I am today, you know. Yeah. You know, so there are people out there that are loving and caring. Yes. You know? And I'm like you, aunt. I would sit down and listen to you all day, mm -hmm. every day. I love mm -hmm. my elders. I love mm -hmm. listening to stories. Mm -hmm. And, but to tell a young person a story, you know, sometimes it's like talking to a brick wall. Yeah. You know, and get past your experience and, and, and all that. Yeah. And a lot of the jails now are getting full of our young ones. Yeah. Not so many old ones now, but a lot of young ones. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is definitely, Ray, uh, an area where, where we really have to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I worked in the, I say, like, over 10 years ago or whatever and teaching in TAFE and, and doing lots of things. But, you know, it astounds me that all the work that we may have put together some time ago, um, that it's still here. And it's, you know, listening to you, um, I think I was talking to someone and, you know, I said, it's not so much the jails, it's the, the what do you call it, the watch house where people put out, you know, we know of our children, our women that are put in there. There's a whole lot of things, you know, like that we've got to take consideration to. But as yeah. a community, as our people, you know, it's like that. We've got to be able to, you know, I, I remember, I just clicked because this is where my storytelling coming, because talking with young people or talking with older people, men, women, and, you know, and, and it is about like, building up that rapport, building up a, a relationship with that person. Mm. And, you know, I've got young fellas today, you know, the you know, young boys, 11, 12, 13, when they are in youth detention. And I can go back to my community, which is Sherberg, and they know my car. And it's that I was thinking when you were talking, Ray, about the continuity of care. Yeah. You, and I think I spoke about that. You know, you can't just go in there and think you can solve the problem or whatever it is yeah. in 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Mm. And as I said, I, I sometimes I have to go, um, you know, three hours, four hours or whatever. Sometimes um, people who come to me, and particularly men, I just let them lie there. I look at them and you're tired. And, they, you know, when they're ready. And it, it might be something that I said... And as I'm doing, as I'm sitting there, it's just my presence. Yeah. It's my presence to be there. Mm. And it's, it's all that. I see these young men, I remember going um, oh, wherever I go, but also once I went into Musgrave Park when we have in Brisbane and we had NAIDOC, NAIDOC week, NAIDOC day. And I'm walking around there or I sit with, in the elders where the elders are and we're all there talking. And this young fellow, he would come up to me, and this is what happens a lot. You remember me, aunt? I said, yeah, I will. That's the way I talk. And they say, yeah, you know, I was in that place there now. Which, where, I don't know. Yeah, you remember me? And then, I'll, then they'll tell me, oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, you were, uh, and I remembered that story. And then they'll come proudly and say, see, look, this is my missus. <laughs> I got a house. I got see these are my children walking around walking around Sherberg. I walk. I don't mm. drive in a car. I walk around, and they call me in. Mm. Show off their little where they've come from, where they come from there here to here. So having full community support and everything, if we we've got to build that up. Yeah. In there because and be strong in being able to do that. I see a lot of changes being made, but it's vital because I, you know, put, putting people in isolation, putting people in 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 cells that don't have windows, 
Um, there's a whole lot of things. I've done work around that, getting people to imagine that there is a window there, that there's a, in, in the watch house, there's a window there, there's a bird, there's all these things. It's our, how we work as Aboriginal people. Yeah. Absolutely. In our old way, old way. It's how we've done and instilled in that. So that when you're going through something, you can close your eyes and you can visualise. Yeah. That's the sort of thing. And I guess in my work, I haven't done it for a long time. I'm out in the community. More what I'm doing is, is as I said, listening. Um, but because of my age and my experience and growing up at everything and becoming a listener, in how I learned this from a young age and some of those old ways, mm. they still matter and still count today. And I'm an old woman now, or mm. not that old, I don't want to say I'm that old, but You're young aren't. <laughs> I know, and but it's like that. And so it's for me and, you know, being, having this opportunity mm. to be here on this panel and talking, it's like, opening that up to me to even further. I am in, in my family home, sitting here with my computer here, learning all this, but I am talking, even this is COVID-19, I've got still got people making time for all this. Yeah. And they listen to this story, as I did with you. And I felt it. I felt it within me. I have never done, but I, I felt it because it related to so many people that I, I had experienced through through the prison systems, through everything, institutions, because that's what's happened. We've yeah. become so institutionalised and it's like, stop, we've got to stop. The buck stops now. Yeah. And, you know, I'm part of an... Um, also, which we're, which we're forming together, an aunties and, and elders and aunties advocacy group. As Aboriginal, Torres Strait Island women, we're all there, the strong women, senior women, senior men coming together because we cannot allow these things to continue, you know, mm. because everyone, our, our children, our, our young people. Um, I remember, you know, lots and lots of things. You've just brought a lot of thoughts back into my head. And... You know, I've been taking little notes and hearing, and I know, and I how much I appreciate being here to hear this and to to be part of this story. It's just part of this mm. um, that I'm sitting, you know, comfortably in my office in the sunroom of my home, and we we've got all these um, technologies and things that we can do this and do the reaching out and knowing. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and the more, you know, there's, like I said, there's young people that are just young boys, just young men that they're up there, I'll call them young men, young boys. And they're sitting around doing their, they're not institutionalised. My daughter pulled them out of that school and mm. we set up a school. It's this, all these sort of things, these are the things if we, you know, if we're ever going to stop it, because we've got to look after our own mob. But oh. in looking after our own mob, we're also looking after the rest of the mob. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks for that, Anna. And, you know, we appreciate um, you and the others um, coming on today and mm. uh, participating and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, yeah, we very much appreciate that. I think, you know, like a, a good um, thing that you touched on, Anna, is like, although all this stuff's going on with COVID and all that, um, it has opened up an um, opportunity for us to be able to engage one another in a way that everybody's comfortable, as you said. And I think that, you know, after this is over, I think if we as a community continue to, yeah. To, yeah. to use these um, tools that are within our hands, they're cost effective. And, you know, I think it's a great way of um, engaging the mob and um, staying connected. So I'm yeah. um, just conscious of the time. Um, I just want to once again, thank you all for, for coming on board and um, sharing. And um, yes, we look forward to um, touching base again soon. I just yeah. want to wish everybody a, a great rest of their week and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Michelle.